This is my business partner, Becky Burley. We started What Drives Winning uh, about seven years ago at the University of Florida. And we're gonna start with this guy right here. This is Jeremy Foley. Becky, do you wanna just enlighten them? How would you describe Jeremy? Well, Jeremy hired me, um, so I'm always gonna be eternally grateful to him. But also, um, Jeremy's just a guy who has like a really clear vision of what he expected from us. Um, and he had really high standards. And when he was young, this was his license plate that he had on his truck. And it stood for just get it done. And he said it was symbolic because he would run anybody that would get in his way over. And he evolved his leadership style over time. And it didn't just start with the truck. No, one, one year, we always gave out t-shirts to our student athletes at the beginning of the school year. And one year, um, all the athletes and all the coaches also got a JGID t-shirt. <laughs> and they won a lot of national championships across all sports. It became known as Title Town. But upon reflection, he looked at all the rings that he had compiled over a long period of time. And he asked himself, what am I going to do with them? What's going to happen when I die? Because he doesn't have a family. And that was kind of an eerie thought for us. Yeah, and I think with Jeremy, too, I mean, literally, he spent his entire professional career as a Gator. He started as an intern in the ticket office, worked his way all the way up to athletic director. I mean, his entire life was devoted to the Gators. And Becky snuck a picture. So institutional loyalty is a thing. Nobody cares more about that brand than Jeremy. That was at a tennis match. I was kind of like... But uh, yeah, he was the Gator through and through, no doubt. And when September 11th happened, he met with every coach. He did. And I think that was a real turning point for him because, you know, he had quite a few friends that were living in New York at the time. And I remember specifically the meeting he had with me. And I think he really felt like there was a shift in him at that point. And he said, you know, I want to be able to focus more on the people that I'm around. He put an emphasis on people, and I think it's because he saw what would happen after people won a national championship. And the first person we're gonna look at is Billy Donovan, who won two of them. And this is something that Billy would talk to other coaches about because when Billy got involved, we started to do a collaboration that really kind of turned into group therapy. There's no doubt that that collaboration probably saved or extended a lot of people's careers in our department. It was a huge part of what we do and still is. And you can see the authenticity in this clip. You know, it was amazing. I, I talked to uh, a couple coaches and, and uh, you know, I have to get, boy, I have to get to a Final Four. I can't get to a Final Four. I get to a Final Four. And, and they got to a Final Four. And, um, you know, don't win the national championship. And I, I, wouldn't, I said, listen, it's not going to stop because if you do win the national championship, I've got to do it again. And then if it's like, right, now i got to do it again. Now i got to do it. And, and it just doesn't stop because what happens is you have to look at yourself and say, okay, like, why do I need this all the time for me feeling good about myself or my own personal approval or to build me up to make me feel better about myself? And that was such a, a truthful clip that he said, because what inspired the discussion after that is we asked the question, what do you need to feel good about you? And there were so many extrinsic things that people would say in that room. Can you talk to that? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it's not just about winning championships. You know, it's about when everyone around you becomes invested in your win-loss record and not necessarily just because of the win-loss record, but maybe it's, you know, I don't want to move my family again. You know, my husband or wife loves living in this place. I don't want to move them. And so it becomes like this pressure that continues to build. And a lot of the people Jeremy would hire were younger. And so they didn't have a track record behind them. So they felt that the way that they would prove their worth is through outcomes, which we know is ultimately outside of our control. And one of the people that Billy introduced me to was Anthony DeMello, who wrote an incredible book called The Way to Love. And I'd like to show you a clip from him. This had a profound impact on that group. Let me explain it in this way. it will be a kind of a meditation that you and I will do together. Think of a little child. It's given a taste for drugs. As it grows up, the whole body of that child is craving for the drug. To live without the drug brings a pain and a suffering so great that it seems preferable to die. You and I, as children, were given a drug. It was called approval. It was called appreciation. It was called praise. 
success, acceptance, popularity. Once you took the drug, society could control you. The tentacles of society got into you. You become a robot. You want to see what kind of a robot existence human beings live? Listen to this. You've got the robot who comes here, and I say, my, you're looking pretty. And the robot goes right up. I press a button called appreciation, and right up it goes. Then I press another button called criticism, flat on the earth. Total control. We're so affected by this. We're so easily controlled by it. And when we're deprived of it, we become so terrified. We're so frightened to make mistakes. We're so frightened that people will laugh at us. I saw a little kid once, three years old. She wandered into our dining room, dressed in her nighty. So we, we sort of applauded. She thought we were laughing at her. She ran away. And her mother had to carry her in while she was struggling. She didn't want to come. She thought we had laughed at her. And I thought, she's only three years old. But already we've made a little monkey out of her. Somebody taught her this, that when you do this, she's supposed to feel good. And when you say boo, she's supposed to feel bad. Once you give her that drug, she's finished. That, that clip just had so much discussion in our collaboration, because when you think about it, you know, every part of our job has to do with the, or the, you're terrible. And I mean, you just can't escape it in our profession. And one of my favorite stories around this on how to deal with praise came from Bob Stoops. And a couple days earlier, I was at Oklahoma State with Mike Gundy, who was the football coach. And what they would do is they'd go from the hotel, they would walk to the stadium and people would line the streets. And I'll never forget watching a guy on his knees go like this as we were walking, because I was right next to him. And it got me thinking. And when I went to Norman a couple days later, they were gonna have a statue built of Bob Stoops. And I asked them, how do you deal with all the adulation? And he said something really profound to me. He said, you just realize that it's the same men that hung Jesus. He developed a filter to where he didn't accept that praise. And if you think about the generations that you're leading and you think about the impact of their peers weighing in on what they're doing has on them and their ability to perform, it's profound. I had a student write a letter to social media as if it were a person to describe the impact, good or bad, that it has on their life. Dear social media, you feel like an unhealthy relationship that I can't get out of. The amount of time I waste on you is embarrassing to admit. I don't know why I keep coming back to you. It feels like an addiction. When I have a second, I check in on you. You have the power to make me feel good about myself, but also the power to do the opposite. When I'm with you, I start to feel me comparing myself to others, which fuels a dark, competitive energy that scares me. Someone asked me, what value do you add to my life? I didn't have an immediate answer. I started to think about the times that I've taken a break from you and how much healthier I felt without you. But then the fear of missing out brought me right back to you. As I reflect on our relationship, I realize that I need to pursue peace. The question I need to answer is whether or not I can do that with you in my life. So, so powerful. I mean, I think that social media has changed coaching in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I, I reflect on, there was a, it was a basketball game between Florida and Florida State, big rivals. The men's team was playing. Last second of the game, um, FSU takes a shot. And our player at Florida goes to get the rebound and accidentally tips it in. And so FSU wins. They go crazy. Social media goes crazy after that game. And here's a kid trying to make an effort play, inadvertently tips the ball in. And the comments on social media, it was insane what people were saying. And I was just hoping to myself that our player was not on social media after that game. Well, and what happens a lot of times when players are coming up, they're good and no one wants to direct a lot of criticism at them because they're youth, right? So they then take the drug. 
And then as they get better and better and the higher they go, well, now the criticism starts to affect them. And the amount in which they let the positive energy affect them is what the negative energy does to them. And that's something that coaches have to overcome. And the number one album right now is J. Cole's album. And I just wanna play, I wanna show you something. Uh, it has some explicit language. This is J. Cole reflecting on pride. You can see that it brings up issues, feeling shame for having less than others, trying to flash so people think more of you through the material world, makes romantic relationships tough, make family relationships divisive. And it makes me think of those last two lines where he says that I'm slowly realizing that the root of all my problems is pride. So he understands that when people express approval to him, that boosts his pride. And the pride is the very thing that has become very destructive in his life. And that's something that Will Smith addresses in this clip. You know what? It's, um, I, I have um, I transitioned from my material world journey um, to uh, my, my inner journey. And not in, not in a weird way, just in a way is I got to be okay with me. I can't give a fuck what anybody thinks. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like, I don't even look at the box office anymore. I don't even want that in my mind, comparing myself to what other people are doing. And I had a brief moment there where I got stuck on the rock, you know, and he doing all these billion dollar movies and I got stuck in and that, that animal woke up again. But I was like, you know what? It's like, um, I realized there's never enough. You'll never earn enough money. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you, if you stick yourself on sex, you'll never have enough sex. You'll never have enough of anything in the material world. So I'm into my space now where I'm letting go of that. And I just got to be good with me. I got to walk around uh, happy and comfortable with me, no matter what the fuck nobody else think. Right. You know, and that's where I'm at right now, kind of detoxing my addiction to numbers and wins in comparison. Well, I think it's so powerful that he is on that journey and yet still he's vulnerable enough to admit that he, you know, he got caught with the rock in terms of the comparison game. And I think the detox word is probably what hit a lot of coaches at Florida the most, because when you think about trying to get off of that addiction to that drug called approval, there's a detox detoxification process. You know, there's a wonderful line that says that success is intoxicating sustaining requires sobriety and most of the time people don't feel the sobriety unless there's pain involved and they're losing that's absolutely right i think it's you can tell from him grappling with it that it's not an easy process and it brings up your favorite line which is what comparison is the thief of joy and there's a wonderful um video you're going to see about this so there's two monkeys and you think about the Demello line there's two monkeys that are asked to perform the same task but they're given different reward rewards take a look the one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber the one on the right is the one who gets grapes the one who gets cucumber note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine the first piece he eats uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task, and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does. And she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that, she gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. You, you know what's crazy about that clip is because if you think about it, like in our athletic department setting is, you know, let's say I have a season. That's what those coaches look like. <laughs> when we're having the fit <laughs> after right. uh, So I have a season that maybe I feel like I've really maximized my team's ability. 
Um, but I haven't won a championship. And then down the hall, another team, you know, a couple weeks later wins a national championship or any championship. And I'm now thinking like, oh, maybe my season wasn't so great after all. You know, it's that comparison issue that really gets us in trouble. And the next video we're going to show is a coach who's young on her journey. Her name is Lisa Fortier. She is the Gonzaga women's basketball coach. And they were 23 and three this year. And they had an early exit in March which brought up a bunch of pain, embarrassment, humiliation, all the things that are natural when you feel like you should have accomplished more. And so we started to try and unpack what that pain was teaching her. The reason we chose to show this video to you all today is because when we showed this at Florida, it was unbelievable, the discussion that followed. The reality is it's the thinking in your head that's telling you something, right? So check this out. It says, think of an event, identify the negative feeling. You've done that. The loss created sadness, embarrassment, frustration, doubt that you didn't prepare, all the different things, right? Mm. And then it says, what does that say to you about yourself, your values, your way of perceiving the world, your programming, your conditioning? How would you answer that? Bane and um, needy for like accomplishment, maybe, or desiring accomplishment and desiring praise. And like, I, I act like I'm in more control than I am, or I have a, a sentiment or a, a feeling or a belief you know, I've valued work ethic for my whole life. So, and maybe overvalue that. Um, mm, those would be some of the things. So what does that say to you? <laughs> I don't know. Why are you laughing? Because like, it says that I, I don't like that that much. Well, so the beauty is Right. If we're looking at this from an alien's point of view, meaning you're not identified with the person talking right now that and assuming that at, that alien can speak English. If you look at those things, you say you don't want to be those things. True or false. True. This event that you just went through is exposing all your vulnerabilities that are covered up by the 23 and three record. So like, but am I, what is that? And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. So like, I think some of these feelings that I have are because I care, but maybe it's because I care about these things, not about these guys being happy, these guys getting better, these guys growing as leaders, or like, is that what I'm getting confused? We're maybe? touching on some amazing stuff. Amazing, because in college athletics, the head coach, is synonymous with the brand while they're coaching there. Because everything around is trying to convince the recruit that you are the best head coach in the country. And so you become so identified with the outcomes because that's you're conditioned to be that way. You see the graphics that are produced and sent out. You internalize all of those things. Think about that. It's almost like I'm recruiting, like, I'm like the impact. You are the I'm program. I know, but like the, the impact that we're trying to make on the student athletes, because we, we are trying to sell that to them, right, is actually, I don't know if that's working for the recruits, but it's like, it's like affecting me almost. You know it what I mean? It everyone, because it's a drug. Van, that is as vain as it gets. I am better than everybody else come play for me. The need for achievement. Look at the, the cards you're sending out. I'm sure there's, what are those stats that you send? Let's call it out. I, I don't know what they are. This is hysterical though. What has Lisa 48 done from an achievement standpoint that recruits need to know? Tell me about it. I don't, I don't know. What are the proprietary stats? How many times have you won this, uh, the conference? Like, what's the winning percentage? Like, what is it that you guys sell to them? 
there has to be a couple bullet points. We tell them we win a lot. Like we how? Tell them. No, 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 no. Externalize it. Don't cover it up. Just say, hey, I, I don't do know. That. I don't know the numbers. So, but what do you sell to them? We tell them winning percentage championships. We sell them that I've been the coach of the year. And we usually say that. And I always say, which is true. It's a staff award, blah, blah, blah. This is my coach of the year dance. <laughs> I want to play for her. You're a jerk. I need to. Uh, and of in the desire for praise. Look at this. We're deconstructing the artificial nature of everything you're doing. Look at the background. We've talked about it. Like literally look at it. I see it. So you like, why wouldn't those things be a part of you? It's what you sell everyone. I think that uh, the, to see her struggling to figure it out, I wish I had done that as a young coach. I mean, what, what important work she is doing. Um, I think the most salient point for me in that was when she talked about Am I more concerned about them growing as leaders, growing as women, or am I more concerned about getting them here to help me win? And I think that's a, that's a tough thought to wrestle with in your mind. Especially when you realize what a loss does to you. No that, doubt. I mean, that creates a lot of awareness. And, and I think that the, the vulnerability with which she speaks about that is so refreshing because she's willing to figure out like, where does that take her? I, I remember one time I, um, we had exited early in the NCAA tournament and I had a friend that was a coach that had also exited early. So um, probably wasn't thinking ahead on this, but I you know, reached out and I was like, hey, you know, I'd really love to talk to you about your early exit because I feel like you know, we underachieved and I just kind of want to talk that through with you. How did you guys, you know, feel about you in underachieving? <laughs> and she's like, I don't think we underachieved. I was like, oh, let me backpedal out of this room a little. <laughs> but I think it's, it, it's hard to talk about that. Nobody wants to talk about that. And so for her to explore that is amazing. It's the pageantry of college athletics and Billy Donovan. We know that this is a humble guy at heart. And if you walk into the building at Florida, there is a mural of his face that he had to sign off on. And it's not like he wants, and he probably, he always went the side door, so he didn't have to walk by it. But just think about the air that you're breathing every time you walk into that. How could you not think that you're more important than you are, especially when everyone around you is doing the same theater, perpetuating the myth. It's a really confusing place to be. And I think that's why one of our favorite coaches at Florida is Brian Shelton, who is the men's tennis coach who just won the national championship last week. Let, he, let me inter interrupt you there. I mean, if you all don't know Brian Shelton, you need to get to know him. I mean, he got a lot of acclaim last week because they won the national championship. He also won the national championship with the women's team at Georgia Tech. So he's the only coach now that's won it with both men and women. And um, really remarkable story, his son clinched the match for them to win the tournament. Um, but just an A-plus human being and an incredible coach. And this is something that he shared with other coaches on our collaboration. I remember I went to the U.S. Open the very first time, and, and I qualified, and I, I won my first round match, and I got to play Connors on stadium court in front of, you know, 20,000 people. And, you know, first time on that type of stage and literally the first set that I played there that night, I didn't, I didn't see the spectators for a set. And literally I won the first set and I sat down in the chair on the changeover and I looked up and it was the first time in the match that I actually looked up at the whole stadium and saw the scoreboard and saw my name and Connor's name. And <laughs> there was a seven next to mine and a six next to his. And I was like, oh my God. And then, I mean, I lost like probably in like 30 minutes afterwards, six, two, six, two, six, two. And the stage all of a sudden got huge. But for a set there, I was just like, I'm staying right here inside the lines. And that's exactly what happens to the coach. 
that it gets big for them around them. And if they don't stay here, then they can fall victim to some of those trappings. And that's why this mattered so much to the Florida coaches. You know, you think about certain animals that, you know, have, have the eyes on the side of their head and they're the prey, right? You know, they're the ones that are, you know, worried. And as an athlete, you want to be the predator. You want to be the one that's got your eyes out in front and sees what's going on out there and can go make things happen, can go attack. And, you know, think about this. I mean, how many times have you seen a coach that's, you know, getting ready for a big stage and they're getting totally stressed out about, you know, how many people are in the stands or if there's a, a small piece of the grass that's, you know, got a divot, um, just things that don't matter because of the anxiety of the event itself. So it's that exact analogy Brian's using. We're looking all over the place instead of just lasering in on what's important. And I think that's why if we could change the way we think about ourselves from this statement, because this is the common statement, wanting to be the best. But the higher you go, the more you realize that that has the ability to put a ceiling on yourself. And if you want to be the best, you need others to be better than. And so you suppress the ones around you, whether it's teammates or opponents. And if we just change that word, it's intrinsically focused and then everyone can be a partner for growth. And I think that that is what transcendent leadership looks like. It's how can you develop to transcend the environment that's around you.